Dr. Michael Burry became a legend in investment circles following the publication of the book The Big Short, which later received a movie adaptation in 2015. Dr. Burry was portrayed by actor Christian Bale as an eccentric but brilliant investor betting against the U.S. housing market bubble of 07. Yet his trading career goes all the way back to the late 90s and early 2000s. And in fact, Dr. Burry left a large enough footprint online that we can partially reconstruct some of his trade recommendations from that time period. It was his posts and writings on message boards and websites that caught the attention of hedge fund tycoon Joel Greenblatt, who started profiting from Burry's insights. After Dr. Burry decided to quit medicine to start his own hedge fund, he was promptly contacted by Greenblatt, who offered him $1 million in capital in exchange for a stake in the fund. For a number of years in the late 90s and early 2000s, Dr. Burry regaled anyone with an internet connection and an interest in investing with a fairly detailed deconstruction of his thought process when it came to the art of stock picking. From real estate investment trusts owning or leasing assisted living centers and nursing homes, to a Mexican chicken products producer, to software companies offering electronic design automation software, Dr. Burry's picks covered a wide range of industries. In this video, we will be looking at two positions, one on the long side and one on the short side, that I think encapsulate Michael Burry's investment philosophy. But I also invite you to read through the entire collection of MSN Money articles he penned between August 2000 and late February 2002. The link is in the description. As always, if you find my content informative, please consider leaving a like and let us know what you think of Michael Burry's style of investing. The first company is the Avanti Corporation, an interesting value play on a company with quality products, but plagued by intellectual property theft accusations and by the taint of a CEO with little regard for corporate oversight. The Avanti Corporation was what Dr. Burry calls an ick investment, because on the surface, the company seemed a complete mess. Gerald Sue, the CEO, ran this multi-million dollar business like the local mom-and-pop store, appointing his son and a former female Japan Airlines flight attendant with absolutely no technical expertise whatsoever, to very handsomely paid positions. Sue Sr. and the former flight attendant also founded Maingate Electronics to distribute Avanti software in Japan. Given that he owned 50% of the company, Sue had all the incentive to overpay for Maingate's services, so this posed a huge conflict of interest. Oh, and KPMG, Avanti's auditor, also expressed concerns to the SEC about the quality of the company's financial statements. Lastly, there was also the issue of intellectual property theft. Although not the main reason for the company's success in acquiring prominent clients like Intel or Motorola, the truth of the matter is their initial place and route software contained code lifted directly from their competitor's database. Their subsequent product also contained content from two batches of purloined code. This competitor, a company called Cadence Design Systems, noticed how a bug found in the old Cadence software was reproduced verbatim in the Avanti product. This triggered an investigation. And after years in the court system, Sue and five top managers pleaded no contest to conspiring to misappropriate trade secrets and to securities fraud. Sue got away with a slap on the wrist, while his collaborators got the short end of the stick. Yet despite everything I just outlined, and a significant drop in the stock price, Michael Burry correctly identified a potentially profitable value play in the company. 
Sure, the company would have to pay millions in fines to Santa Clara County in California, and much more in restitution to Cadence. Sure, executives would be spending the next few years bench pressing weights in a prison courtyard, but all that notwithstanding, the fact remained that Avanti was a profitable company. With a market cap of only $250 million, the Avanti Corporation had $100 million in cash and was generating another $100 million in free cash flow every year. Dr. Burry started buying at $12 a share in June of 2001. The stock price fell further and he kept buying, all the way down to $2 a share. His thesis was proven right in December 2001, when Avanti agreed to be acquired by Cadence rival Synopsis for a price of $22 a share. This trade highlights Dr. Burry's strategy of buying shares in unpopular companies nobody wants to own, and then selling them when they've been polished a bit. It also underscores his philosophy that volatility isn't in any way related to risk, and showcases his remarkable emotional control. The second pick, this time on the short side, teaches us that profit opportunities often present themselves to investors as a byproduct of research into other stocks. Michael Burry learned everything he could about the electronic design automation industry, and in doing so, probably came across Magma Design Automation, a hot new IPO issue back in 2001. The stock was trading at over 120% of its offering price of $13, partially fueled by rumors Cadence would be forced to buy the company in response to the acquisition of Avanti by Synopsis. Dr. Burry dismissed such rumors, citing a sky-high valuation seemingly detached from reality, and outlined the number of reasons why the company was a good short at $29.50. His prognostications would prove to be correct, as the stock price would plummet over the following three months. In terms of acquisitions, one did eventually materialize in 2012, but from Synopsis, and at a much more sensible price of $7.35 per share. Magma held its IPO in 2001, but the company wouldn't look at all out of place in today's market. The circumstances are similar, and so are the strategies. So basically, Venture Capital had invested in Magma, and was now looking to exit the position at a profit. Unfortunately, Magma had been losing tens of millions of dollars a year, and its IPO filing painted a picture divergent from the company's prior claims pertaining to the size of its backlog. The IPO was delayed, and the company decided to take a step back and regroup. Magma had to woo the investing public by sprucing up its earnings, even if that meant mortgaging the future in the name of short-term gains. To this end, they employed a number of aggressive accounting techniques, still used by companies to this day. So if you see a company doing the following, be wary and make sure their rationale for doing so is aligned with the long-term interests of shareholders. First, sales commissions paid to staff would no longer be paid upon the initial sale, but rather in installments spread out over time. This arrangement helped the company lower costs, at least in the short term. They also started prioritizing perpetual sales, that is, one-time sales, instead of recurring revenue-based subscriptions. Normally, companies prefer recurring streams of revenue, but one-time sales allow them to recognize the revenue up front all at once, thereby boosting their short-term performance. Capital expenditures were also halved during this period, ensuring the company maximized revenues while minimizing expenses. 
Michael Burry's analysis proved to be spot on. He began shorting the company at a price of $29.50 a share in late December 2001 and continued adding to the position as shares in Magma quickly lost value. Ultimately, he covered the position at around $9 per share, a price point 70% lower than when he initiated his short.